Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> hey, hopefully you got an outline coming in today on the way in. You got the one to follow along today as we go through today's message. And so just a couple real quick things before we get going. Um, several of, again, have asked about the last series, Mind Wars and CDs. It's probably easiest if you are interested in the whole series and you want CDs, you could just fill out the little card, put the card in there, and we'll be happy to make them for you and then contact you when that is going to be made, probably next week. And then uh, you'll have them all. And then also... Uh, if you have in, in any of the handouts and stuff like that that you're interested in, all right? So we are in a new series called Unseen World, and uh, last uh, two weeks ago now, two, so we're in week three, two weeks ago we started and we talked about that we live in the physical wor world, we see, we smell, we hear, but there's also the invisible realm as well, and there's angelic beings as well as demonic beings that are taking place and wars that are taking place, and so we're, we're told to live with the armor of God as believers in Jesus Christ, and we talked about that in week one. Week two, we looked at, last week, we looked at demonic forces, and so we talked about their mission, which is to steal, kill, and destroy everything that's important to you, why Satan fell, all that, and what that looks like. And so this week, today, we're going to talk about angelic beings, or the good force, if you will, on God's side, all right? So here's what I know about believers when it comes to angels. Most believers get their view of angels from television. So you know what that means for a pastor? We got some unlearning to do, <laughs> right? So maybe the, some of you remember back in 94, not 1894, but 1994, you guys remember back that far? There was a show that was called Touched by an Angel. Yeah, anybody watch that? My mom, yeah, she, my mom was really into that before uh, she had passed away. And that, were, that ran for nine seasons, um, and I, somebody said, said earlier, they're still on television today. Um, then you had in 94, you had uh, Angels in the Outfield. And then, of course, going way back, and probably a show that we've watched, even though it's old, from 1946, you have It's a Wonderful World. In the 90s, angelology, or the, the interest in angels in church life, was huge. I don't know if you guys remember that far back, but everyone was talking about the interest of angels. They wanted to know about it and all this other kind of stuff. And so we get it from television. And so there's this view that an angel is this little bald-headed baby-looking thing that has wings strumming a harp on, on a cloud in heaven or playing a violin or something like that. That is not a picture of an angel, right? Also, one that's oftentimes believed is that angels are loved ones who pass away, and they sprout wings after they die, and they go into the presence of the Lord, and they're, they're, they, they are your guardian angel, and they fly around in heaven, you know, kind of things. That isn't the case either. And so, not to be, you know, hurtful or anything, if a person dies that are, is a believer in Jesus Christ, they are absent from the body, present with the Lord. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when a person dies who's a believer, they're in the presence of the Lord. No wings, they're not floating around, none of that kind of stuff. And if a person dies who isn't in a personal relationship with Christ, then they experience judgment, right? And so they're, they're in the absence or the, uh, they're not in the presence of, of the Lord. The other thing that we oftentimes get is that loved ones become guardian angels, and so they're flying around us to kind of protect us. And so let's, you guys want to have a little fun? Yeah. Okay, so let me just tell you what I told the other two services. Last week, you didn't laugh. I turned up the heat. Okay? I have that kind of power. If you laugh, I'll turn it down to maybe the mid-90s by Wednesday. <laughs> okay? Yeah, all right, 72. That was a fake laugh. I can tell it anywhere I see it, right? So, so um, yeah, let's get a little lively. I don't need you guys to go, uh, go to sleep on me. So, um, what was I saying? Oh, guardian angels. So, um, <clears throat> let, so, a little fun. So, it's like, you know, you love grandma, you love grandpa, they die, and they're like, grandma's my guardian angel. Do you really want grandma to be your guardian angel? <laughs> Do you really want her to see everything that's going on in your life? 
And the answer to that is probably, go ahead, no. Okay, all right, so let's move on. Yeah, it's a warm thought, and we go, oh, isn't that nice? But it's not biblical, okay? It's not true. So here's a couple things that we know about what Scripture teaches. Um, Angels are created beings. They do not have the deity of God, meaning that they're not all-knowing, all-powerful, they're not in, uh, in all places, and that kind of stuff. Paul refers to, de- uh, to angels and demons as principalities and powers, and so he will refer to them uh, throughout the New Testament that way. Um, we don't know how many angels that there are, um, but we do know, and we'll see a passage today, that they talk about thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000, so we know that there are, are a lot of them. Um, angels have similar personalities as humans. And so that doesn't mean that they're humans, but they have certain personalities. They have intellect. They have feelings, according to Ezekiel chapter 28. They're able to have conversations, and they're able to know things in Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 5. We know that they have a will because Lucifer had a will to become prideful and become more powerful than God, and he was cast out from heaven. And so those are a few of the things that we know. So people will ask, well, Pastor Dan, do you actually believe in the invisible realm? And the answer to that is I absolutely do. Now, I get it. I live in, a, in a, the physical realm. It's, you smell, you hear, you know, all that kinds of stuff. But I believe that there is an invisible realm that is taking place and that there are angelic as well as demonic forces that are battling I think that there are times where we have demons in our presence. In the first service, we had some sound issues, and so Pastor Eric was joking about that. We may have had some. We're talking about angels today, but we had some demons here, all right? And so uh, anyway, but I think that those are actually real things in in, in our life. Now, do I... Have I had an experience where someone, you know, I had an encounter with someone and it's like, that's an angel. I have not personally had one, okay? But I have talked to people who have. Actually, my wife has. She says every morning she wakes up. (laughs) She's in the presence of an angelic being. And so I said, honey, that is so sweet. But, you know... I am rock solid, I'm a wonderful guy, but, but I'm not perfect. And she goes, oh no, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about this little angel figure over here on the nightstand. <laughs> now I'm just kidding, she did not say that, she's in here, she's going to kill me later. So if I'm not here, say nice things about me next week. So anyhow, but, but I've never had it, I have had people that I, I respect from a, you know, from a theological standpoint tell me their stories of their encounters, and I think that they are, they're plausible. It's like, yeah, it's consistent with scripture. Some of them not so much but is consistent. The one thing I did say in week one, and it wasn't an offense to women, but there are no, in scripture, there are no women angels, only males, all right? They're only referred to in the masculine form. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not angels. You can go home and fight about it amongst yourselves, all right? But I'm just telling you, my job is to bring the male, don't shoot the mailman, all right? So here's a couple encounters that we find in Scripture that talks about where they actually believed that they were human form. And so there's a couple in your outline before we get going in today's lesson, and it's going to be similar to last week. We're just going to kind of go through with some information. But in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham has an experience. Abraham is hanging out uh, by, by the tree and just kind of relaxing, and all of a sudden in, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, uh, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great tree of Mamre when he was sitting in the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day. So it's just like it is right now today. Verse 2, Abraham looked up and he saw, what did he see? Three men. So we know one is the Lord and the other two were angelic beings. He actually thought that they were physical people, physical human. They had the form of a human, of a human being. And, and so he thought that he, if you read through, he tells Sarah to go get some bread, make some bread, let's feed these people and let's take care of them. And then if you go down into Genesis chapter 19, the same two angels appeared to, to, uh, to Lot in Sodom. 
and he, he is at the gate entrance of, uh, of, that, of Sodom, and it says, two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them, and he bowed down uh, with his face to the ground. Now, verse 2 says, he says, my Lord. Now, that does not mean that he thought that they were a deity. That was the way that you would welcome someone. So we would say, good morning, good afternoon, you know, that kind of thing. It was a way of just greeting someone. And so he was just greeting them. And so it implies that he actually thought they were people because he goes on and he tells them, to please turn aside to your servant's house. In other words, you don't have a place to live tonight. You want to hang out with me? No problem. I got a room open. You can do that. And he says, you can go wash your feet because you would wash your feet before you entered someone's house. And then you could spend the night with me and hang out. And so here a lot thought that these two angelic beings were actually uh, humans. And so they were going to eat and dine with him and the whole bit, okay? And then that is why in Hebrews 13, verse 2, it says, do not forget to entertain strangers. Now, not strange people, but strangers, right? For by uh, so doing, some people have entertained who? Angels without knowing it, all right? And, and so th this is the case where it, it takes place. Now, little sidebar, all right, we are not, as believers, to focus on angels. We are not to try to contact angels, nor are we to pray to angels, okay? And so we have one that we seek, and that is Jesus, right? And if Jesus decides to bring in angelic beings into our life, so be it, but we do not seek them out. And the reason why is because Satan masquerades as an angel of light, right? And so if you're seeking them, you don't know what you're going to end up getting. He's not going to show up in a red cape and, a, you know, horns and a pitchfork like a, some Halloween costume. He's going to show up as an angel of light, and then you're going to have a, a little bit of a mess on your hands. Amen? All right, so here we go. Let's talk a little bit more about angels. So who are angels? It's a baseball team in Anaheim that moved to L.A. They have great players, and they're terrible, that's all I know. All right. No, that's on television. That's a baseball team. All right. They are terrible. Um, so here, here's what we know about the angels. Any sports players? Or you guys have no idea. Are you guys alert? It's 115 the middle of the week. You know what I'm saying? I feel no love in the house today. All right. So I'm turning up the heat on you folks. You're, the, the water in your pool is going to evaporate by the end of the message. All right, that's how bad it's going to get, all right? So here we go. Number one in your outline, the angels are worshipers. Any worshipers in the house? Yes. Yeah. So the angels are worshipers in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, and it says again, uh, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels, what are they going to do? They're, they're going to they're worship him, right? And then John gets part of the revelation, uh, to John in Revelation 5, he says, when he looked up, he heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne uh, uh, and the living creatures and the elders. And in verse 12, in a loud voice, they sang, and look what they sang, I did it my way. <laughs> Is that what they sang? No, because we're not to live our way, we're to live the Lord's way. And so look what it says, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And so the angelic beings were singing in a loud voice, right? And if we're quiet, we might listen, we, could, we possibly could hear them. Number two in your outline is that angels are warriors, right? In the sporting term, not the Golden State Warriors, a different one. So they are worshipers and they are, and they are warriors. Last week and the last two weeks, we actually looked in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel received a vision of a war that was going to be, a prophecy that was going to take place. He prayed, God heard him, and God sent an angel, and that angel was intercepted by an enemy angel, a demonic angel, and they fought for 21 days in Daniel chapter 10, and then eventually Michael the archangel came and released that angel. That angel went to Daniel and continued to give him the message that God ultimately had sent 
um, to him. And so in, in 1 Chronicles chapter, uh, 21, verse 20, er, chapter 21, verse 27, it says, Then the Lord spoke to the angel. So here you have an experience where David sees suspended between heaven and earth an angelic being with a great big sword. And that sword is going to bring judgment on Jerusalem. And God speaks to the angel in, in uh, First Chronicles, and the Lord spoke to the angel, and he said, put back the sword. Right? There was going to be compassion and grace that was going to be given to them. And then in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35, the night, um, that night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp, right? And so you have a picture of, of a warrior. And then we looked at last week, the last couple of weeks actually, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Uh, and uh, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon was a picture of Satan. So not like a dragon like we, you know, we think in, in movies today, but it was a picture of the devil. And it says, and the dragons and his angels fought back. And so we see in there that they are worshipers. They are warriors. Number three in your outline is they are messengers from God. They are messengers from God. <clears throat> Gideon is hiding out. He's a fearful of the Midianites. And so he's afraid that he's going to be killed. And so he's hiding in the caves. And, and God sends an angel as a messenger to give Gideon a message. And in Judges chapter 6, verse 12, it says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you. And then what's he call him? Mighty warrior, right? In other words, he says, you are a winner because you are not fighting for a win, and we're going to get at this at the end of the message, but you are fighting from victory, not for victory in your life. And so the angel tells Gideon that you are, victor, you are, you are going to have a victory, you are victorious in your life, and I think it's important for us to understand that as, as well. And then you have another case where you have a messenger of the Lord in Luke chapter 1, the greatest story ever told, right? Where we have a virgin birth and the greatest news that Christ was going to be born into the world. And so an angel appears to Mary, who's a teenager, and she is pregnant. And it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be a child and you'll give birth to a son and you will give him the name of of Jesus. And obviously that is the greatest news ever told. So we find who are they in scripture? They are worshipers, they are warriors, and then ultimately they are messengers in our life. And so again, as we just pause to just think about it, it's like, Pastor Dan, so you actually believe that, and I actually do believe that. Again, I get it because I live in the physical realm and you see and you smell and you hear, but I do believe that there are times where God is going to use angelic beings as well as there are going to be times in our life where we're going to experience demonic forces. Not, we're not going to be possessed as believers, but we can certainly be oppressed. We talked about that last week in our life. And so there are certainly times where that's going to take place, all right? So then what do they do? What do angels do? Number one in your outline is they give you direction, all right? So long before the telephone or the, the iPhone and g whatever, Google Maps and all that kind of stuff, they had angelic beings that would give you guidance and direction. When you think about, we talked about Mary, you think about the interaction that Joseph had with angels, right? So not only did, did Joseph hear a direction at the beginning of the pregnancy of Mary, but he also had direction after the pregnancy where he told him where to go and how to stay away. And I, and I, I love the story and I like the pause because I want the Bible to be alive to you guys. Because uh, you read it, you read through the birth of Jesus and the pregnancy of Mary and Joseph and all this other stuff, and it's like you got Christmas and you got Easter and amen, you close your book and you go away. But just for a moment... Let's just put our feet into that story and let's actually live that out. How would it be if you were a friend of Joseph or you were a mom or dad or grandma or grandfather of Joseph? So imagine how it went. So all of a sudden, Mary comes to Joseph and Mary says, I'm pregnant. Now, he's pledged to be married to her. You're not married yet. It's not like, an, it's not like 
our marriage set up, it's a little bit different. But nonetheless, there's no hanky-panky during the engagement. You wait till after the marriage is over and the, the wedding takes place. And so Mary comes to Joseph and she says, I'm pregnant. And he's like, great, I wasn't there. Right? So then she tells him, and by the way, I believe this, she tells him that she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's a big thing to try to grab a hold of. Would you agree? Yeah. Right? So imagine you're Joseph's family. So imagine you come home and Joseph's in the living room or kitchen and he says, Guess what? Mom, Dad, Granny, Grandpa, guess what? You know, Mary, she's pregnant. Okay? Now, I don't know, it probably wasn't like this for you because you guys were perfect and I had problems, but whenever I got in trouble, my mom had a different name for me when I was in trouble than my normal name. Did you ever have that? Right? I can't say what she called me because we're in church. So anyhow, <laughs> I'm just kidding. So imagine Joseph, right? He probably didn't go by Joseph when he was in trouble, so Mary's mother, or Joseph's mother, they are wonderful people. They love God. He comes from a great family. So you could imagine him coming home and going, hey, mom, I got some news to tell you. Oh, wonderful. What is it, Joseph? Well, you know that young lady that I hang out with, Mary, she's pregnant, right? So here's what mom's going to say. Joe. I told you, you don't get the cart before the horse. You have to wait until you get married before there's any hanky-panky going on, right? And then Joe tells Granny, right, well, Mom, she's pregnant by God. That is a tough, tough story to grab a hold of. Would you agree with that? right? So look what God does in the life of Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream because he is not excited about what he's getting into. He's trying to figure out a way to shun her without humiliating her. And so God sends a messenger to give him direction. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Take Mary home as your wife, because what she has conceived is from the Holy Spirit, right? So God in his wisdom sends forth an angel to give Joseph direction in his life in, in, an, in a story, and again, I believe it with all my heart, but in a story that if we're honest, we're like, boy, that's a tough one to grab a hold of, right? And yet God comforts him, gives him peace, and then all throughout uh, the, the pregnancy and the birth of Christ. Another one in the Old Testament, which is another funny story, is the, the Balaam. You guys know Balaam? Yeah? Balaam has a donkey, right? And every time I read it, I always think, God, there is a chance that you could use me. Because you use the donkey, there's an outside chance I can get used. Would you agree with that? Right? Oh, thank you. Now I feel really good about myself, all right? It's 115 today. All right. So, so Balaam is, a lot of folks don't know this, he is a pagan prophet. And so some people come to Balaam and says, I want you to curse Israel. Well, you can't curse Israel because Israel is the chosen people. So that can't take place. You can't curse what God has blessed, right? So he says, I can't do it. And so the guys come back to him and says, we want you to do it again. And so he ends up saying, I'm going to ask God. And so God goes to Balaam and says, you can go as long as you do what I say and say what I tell you to say, right? Now, God is not happy with Balaam. He is not thrilled with him. And so he lets Balaam go and he saddles up on his donkey in verse uh, 21 in Numbers 22. He says, Balaam got, on, uh, got up in the morning, saddled his donkey and went with the, the princes of Moab, that is a regional area of there, verse 22, but God was very angry when he went, and an angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him, all right? So here you have this. Now, Balaam does not see this. He is like you and I when it comes to the invisible realm at this moment. He is not there. He's not seeing it. 
So Balaam was riding on his donkey, the verse goes, uh, uh, and his two servants were with him. Verse 23, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road uh, uh, with a drawn sword in its hand, she, so it was a female donkey, she turned off the road into the field. Now, Balaam is not happy about the behavior of his donkey. And so what does Balaam do? Balaam beats her to get her back on the road. Right? And so he gets off, bad donkey, bad donkey, bad donkey. I, I, when I was a kid, I rode donkeys quite a bit, actually. They are the most stubborn animals you've ever ridden in your whole life. When they don't want to move, they don't want to move. They're just not going to go. In this case, the, the donkey sees the angel of the Lord. She, she veers, veers off into the field. And so Balaam gets off, bad donkey, you know, whoop, 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 beats, beats, beats. So then all of a sudden, the angel appears again. And now this time... The donkey sees the angel, and it veers into a cliff, and it crushes the foot of Balaam. He is not thrilled about it either, right? So in verse 28, it says, when the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, okay? Now, this is, remember Mr. Ed, for those of us who have been around for a week or two? All right, this is a Mr. Ed moment in the Bible, all right? So, so here it is. So, uh, so she says... Um, so the, don- the Lord opens up the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make, uh, to make you beat me three times? Okay. Now, this is, to me, the most amazing part of the whole story. Okay, you ready? It's verse 29. Balaam answered the donkey. <laughs> right? Now, be honest. If your donkey started talking to you, Are you going to have a conversation with that donkey? I'm not. I'm either going to see Jesus or I'm going to run for the hills, right? If my my donkey turned around to me and started having a conversation, I'm out of (laughs) here. Beam me up, Scotty. I'm gone, right? So, So Balaam answers the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. Right? So he's obviously pretty hacked about the donkey. And the donkey said to Balaam, and this is this conversation, it's so hilarious. I am not, uh, am I not your donkey, which you have ridden, right, to this day? In other words, hey, I've been your favorite donkey for a long time. It's been good. You've ridden me. I've always taken you. I've done the things that you wanted to do. You know, I don't know what's up with you. Have I, uh, have I been in the habit of doing this to you? And Balaam answers, no. You're a good donkey, right? Well, this time the donkey sees, the, the, the second time, the donkey sees the angel of the Lord, and she doesn't veer off into the field. She just rolls over. She's like, I'm not going anywhere, right? You can go. I'm not riding. You're not riding me, right? So, so the verse goes on in verse 31. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword, uh, sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down, right? And, and so all of a sudden here we have God giving direction. Now, now I pause to say this, right? I mean, that's in a pretty extreme situation. But, but I wonder in our life, if there's times in our life where we don't have angelic beings intercept our life to slow us down, to send us in a different direction, to allow a different encounter to take place than what was going to happen. Again, we don't live in that realm because we're talking about, you know, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, and that's the world in which we work. But what if our eyes were open and we actually did see that there were times where there are angelic beings that are slowing us down or stopping us or leading us in a different direction in, in our life where maybe there's a roadblock, right? And, and I think that it's, in, it's, it's certainly scriptural for those types of things um, to take place in our life. Number two in your outline is angels protect you from danger. And as I mentioned, nowhere in scripture does it talk about guardian angels that have been assigned to you. So there isn't, you know, you don't have Joe floating above you as the guardian angel in your life, and you don't have a loved one who's passed away that's a guardian angel in your life. That is just not in Scripture. But there are times where we do find it in in Psalms 91, which is actually the verse that Satan quoted as we talked about this last week when he's uh, tempting Jesus. And he says, 
when, um, four, verse 11, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And so obviously there's, there's verses in, in scripture that talks about angelic beings uh, protecting us. Peter in the New Testament is in prison and Herod is going to decide whether his, what his fate is, whether he's going to live or die or what the case may be. And in Acts chapter 12, Again, another amazing account that takes place. Suddenly, the angel of the Lord appeared in the light shone in the cell. He struck Peter in the side to wake him up. So imagine you get the little rib shot, wake up, boom, boom, boom. And, uh, and when he woke up, it, it said the chains fell off of Peter's wrists, right? So imagine that. All of a sudden, you get an elbow shot, you wake up, there's a light, there's the angel of the Lord, your chains fall off your wrist. And it goes on and it says, then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your, clo- uh, your cloak around you and follow me, uh, the angel told him. And then in verse 11, uh, it says, and Peter came to himself, uh, to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent uh, his angel to rescue me from Herod's cl- uh, clutches and from everything the Jewish people had anticipated, right? And, and so l- let me just kind of pause to say this, and we're going to see this with the, with the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, is that when we have or if we have one of those encounters, it's not for you to kind of like make yourself something special. It's so that you recognize that the Lord is faithful in your life right? And so when we have those encounters, it's not about, and I had an experience with an angel. How about you, right? It's like the Lord is faithful, and he will bring people into our life. And so Peter actually comes to that place in his mind where he recognizes, hey, the Lord's hand is is in my life, and, you know, he's guiding and directing my life. Number three in your outline, the third thing is angels minister to you, And every Sunday that you guys come here, you experience an angelic being ministering to you. (laughs) Pastor Eric. All right? So, it's 118 this week. The laughter is fading. All right? It's fading. So, right now, I'm turning it up. I'm going to just, yeah, crank it up. All right? So, uh, in in Hebrews 1, verse uh, 14, here's what it says. Um, Are not all angels ministering spirits... Uh, sent to serve those who will inherit salvation, right? So I, I just think that's a beautiful picture of our life. And then you start thinking about the life of Jesus. When Jesus fasted uh, for 40 days, and we talked about this yesterday, last week, the, the Satan comes and tempts him three times. And remember, Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written, which is a reminder to us that when we face temptation, we don't have a, a, a nice thought or a friendly thought or a humanistic thought. We have to have a God thought to counter the temptation that we're going through. And so he says, it is written. And so in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, the, de- the devil flees, and it says, the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And the word minister there in the Greek means to attend to, to wait upon, and to minister to a friend, right? And and again, I just think it's a beautiful picture of how God cares about us and that there are times in our life where we're either going to experience an angel that is in human form or isn't, and yet He's still going to have a ministering spirit. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember that at the end of his life, he is praying about the cup and he says, Father, if it's your will for this cup to pass my hand, in other words, if I don't have to go on the cross, I'm okay with that. And then he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's in anguish. There's pain, there's sweat, there's blood that's being dripped from from his brow. And it says in in, in, uh, Luke 22, verse uh, 43, and it says, the angel of heaven appeared to him, and what did he do? He strengthened him, right? And and again, just my thoughts, and I want to kind of expand your horizon, not not to be, you know, kind of kooky or anything like that, but, but I wonder if there's times in our life where we're exhausted physically, emotionally, spiritually. I wonder if there are times where that God brings a person into our life to give us encouragement, to give us support, right? Maybe our marriage is struggling or our health is struggling and God brings those people. That would fit perfectly well in Scripture that God would bring in people into our life, angelic beings in our life, to help us in the midst of 
those difficult times. So we live in an unseen world. There is the physical that we see, smell, and hear, right, and taste, but there's also the invisible realm as well that that is taking place. And so our battle is not against flesh and blood, right? It's not against people, but it's against principalities, powers, and darknesses. And so we're told to put on the full armor of God, and we're to put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the shoes that are prepared by the gospel of peace, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that we are to prepare ourselves for the battle that is taking place. Because as believers, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. You say, well, what does that mean? Too often, believers are striving for, laboring for, trying, working as hard as they can for. That is not the position that God has placed us in. We aren't fighting for any. I'm not fighting for forgiveness. As a believer, I have been forgiven because of what Christ has done for me. I'm not fighting for the mind of Christ. I have been given, as a believer, the mind of Christ. I'm not fighting to be a new creation. I have been given a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so it's this idea that we're like fighting and struggling and, you know, just like we're running up Mount Everest in our life. And, and yet, yet when we look at Scripture and we look at who we are in Christ and our position in Christ, that's not what we, we have to relax and rest in our identity of who we are in Christ. We need to just take a deep breath and recognize that. And so a few weeks ago, I gave you guys that I am statement that had the scripture, and there's still some handouts on the way. And so last night I was just praying through it, and I thought this is a great example. So I am strong and mighty in Christ. I'm not fighting for that because Ephesians 6 says that's who I am in Christ, right? I, I have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. I'm not fighting for that. Romans 8, 11 tells me that as a believer that I have that. I am a weapon of righteousness in a dark world. I am not my past. I am not who people say I am. I am not who people think I am. I am who Christ says that I am, right? And that's in Psalms 103. And so, you know, you go through, I am forgiven in Psalms 101, and all the passages are in there, but I am forgiven. I have been redeemed. I have been set free. I'm not a hostage of my unhealthy thoughts. I'm a we- uh, 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 the weapons that I fight with are not of this world. I have the weapons to fight that demolishes the stronghold, 2 Corinthians. I have the mind of Christ that directs me. I have the word of God that guides my steps. I trust in God. I receive his peace that guards my heart, <laughs> excuse me, my heart, my mind, and my soul in Christ Jesus. I'm not fighting for that. I'm not pleading for that. I'm not begging God for that. That is given to me because I am a child of the living God. I'm not asking, Lord, please help me. The promise is the Lord is my helper, right? And and so when, when we recognize the spiritual battle that we're in, there's a physical one and then there's an invisible one. But you have to recognize your position if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Rest in it. Rest in it. Relax in the presence of the living God that spoke the world into existence, that promises you that when you seek Him, He will meet all of your needs in your life. Just relax in His amazing grace And stop working to try to earn it. He wants to give it to you in life. And I think when you begin to recognize who you are in Christ, it changes everything. It's like a relationship with with my kids, right? My kids don't have to plead with me to be their father. I am their father, right? They don't have to beg for whatever. 
They're my kids. And so it is with our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. There's a hand answer on the way out. Some of you guys need them. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and grace. Father, thank you for this time today, today together. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, we are in an visible and an invisible world. And Lord, I pray that we will begin to fight the spiritual battle, not from striving for victory, but that we will fight from victory in our life. And we will rest in your presence, that we will experience your amazing grace, that we'll walk in your amazing love that you have for us. And Lord, we are so grateful that you have given us that ability to do that. And so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ and that is the place that puts you in position from a winning standpoint. And we do a little ABC here to invite Jesus into our life. There's no pattern in scripture, but it's just the way we track. A is admit that we're sinners. We're all sinners. We've all missed the mark. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And C is to confess him as your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here, you're watching online, and you've never invited Jesus into your life, will you just say this prayer with me silently? Repeat after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I have missed the mark. And Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you died on a cross and that you rose again and that you're seated at the right hand of the Father. And there'll be a day in your glory that you'll come. And Lord, today, I confess you to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. hey, if you prayed that prayer, there's an outlet, there's a little card there you can check, drop it in the box on the way out. If you're watching online, you can send, the, t- send us a text. So next Sunday is, we're gonna start uh, a series. It's gonna be the same series, but it's gonna be three weeks on the Holy Spirit. And we're also gonna have the Lord's Supper next week. So if you're interested in that, come on out. So remember, you are gonna walk in the presence of the Lord. And you're going to walk in victory, not because you have to earn it, but because Jesus has given it to you and he has fought the battle. Have you ever taped a, 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 leave the doors closed. I got to, I got to straighten these people out. (laughs) Have you ever, have you ever taped this? No, I'm just kidding, John. Have you ever taped the sporting good, like a baseball game or something like that or football? And you're like, I don't want to, I don't want to hear who wins. And then someone tells you, hey, the whoever team won. Right, and, and, and you're sitting there in your home and you're like, I, don't, I didn't want to hear it, but I'm going to watch it anyway. And every time you watch it, and you know your team won, right? And there's an interception or the guy hits a home run or the, the three-pointer, whatever the show is, that, whatever sport you're watching. The whole time, you know when the time runs out, your team's going to win. You're not stressed about it. You're just like, ah, it's all good. We're going to win anyway. We don't care. Home run, grand slam, whatever, doesn't matter. Because you know your team won because someone tipped you off. Amen? Amen. Christ has won. Go live it. God bless you guys. What an incredible experience. Remember, we go live every weekend, so be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so you can be notified whenever we upload new content. I also want to invite you to join us for an in-person service when you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Laurel Ridge family. You can find out more about Laurel Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. And we can't wait to see you next time. Until then, have a great week and remember, God loves you.